Hey everyone, Dr. Hanisha here. Thank you so much for joining me on my podcast, Mahan Health with Dr. Hanisha. Mahan literally translates to great in Sanskrit, and it just doesn't make sense to have anything but the absolute best when it comes to your health. My goal is by you listening or watching this podcast, you're getting just a little bit closer to achieving Mahan or great health yourself. This podcast is all for you, so please make sure to comment what you'd like to learn more about so I can get a guest on the show who's an expert in that field, or I might even talk about it myself. I am now seeing patients and clients all over the world virtually, so make sure to book your free 15-minute phone call today to see how you can start achieving Mahan or great health yourself. I also want to mention that there's a lot going on right now in terms of the coronavirus and the pandemic that's happening, and so I want to mention that if you're in a state where naturopathic medicine is not currently licensed and you've been if, and if you've experienced any benefits from holistic, naturopathic, or functional medicine doctors, please make sure to look out for call to actions because right now in the state of Ohio, we're currently work, working on pushing emergency licensure so we can support our MD and DO colleagues in reducing the overwhelm of our healthcare system. Just a little bit more of a background in that, NDs are trained comparably to conventional doctors to diagnose and triage according to presenting symptoms, referring to the appropriate level of care and support patients uh, during at-home symptom management. So this is really important with what's going on with our healthcare system being super overwhelmed right now. And as we do practice more patient-centered medicine and tailor personalized care plans, we can We also, of course, abide with the public health recommendations, and we have a full toolkit of treatment approaches that can be used to support the body's inherent immune capacity to prevent viral infections, address viral infections directly, and ease symptoms of those infected and support recovery during post-infection care. So this will significantly help to increase access to care. So please be on the lookout for that because NDs, are some of the only ones who have been trained in herbal medicines and um, nutrition where we have a full toolkit, like I said, that have these things have a pharmacological effect on these related viruses. And naturopathic doctors are the only licensed healthcare providers trained in the science and clinical use of these agents. So we really are encouraging the rapid exploration and study of these novel agents so that we can be of support in this crisis. So with all that said, please make sure to follow my social media pages for how you can support these endeavors because we will be putting out call to actions most likely within the week in Ohio, but I know this is happening all over the country. So make sure to reach out to your local naturopathic doctors uh, so that you can start taking part and be supportive in this process and take part in helping with licensure in in your state so that you can have more access to naturopathic medicine as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for um, listening to all of that and doing your part to support our healthcare providers, which, of course, we are so grateful for them at this time for the the ones who are in the front lines right now. And, of course, the people that we don't always think about, the grocery store workers, the restaurant um, employees, the sanitation employees, all these people who are making sure that we stay safe and healthy. I'm extremely grateful for them. So make sure that you are expressing gratitude for them as well. All right, moving on to what today's episode is all about. Today's episode, I actually had the opportunity to interview a friend, an inspiration, and an esteemed colleague of mine, Dr. Mark Heisig, and we're talking all about concussions. Dr. Mark Heisig is a naturopathic doctor in Scottsdale, Arizona. He completed his medical education at Bassier University in Seattle, Washington. His undergraduate education was at Northern Arizona University, where he received his Bachelor's of Sciences in Biomedical Sciences. While in Seattle, Dr. Heisig completed postdoctoral training in applied clinical neuroscience with the Carrick Institute for Graduate Studies. This training has made him eligible for fellowship recognition upon examination. The integration of naturopathic and functional medicine with a dynamic means for evaluating the nervous system gives Dr. Heisig a unique approach to interacting with patients and helping them overcome their health concerns. Dr. Heisig strives to be a leader in integrative concussion recovery in Arizona, inspiring athletes and individuals of all 
of all ages with simplicity and innovation to achieve new levels of higher quality performance in sport and life. So he's actually one of my smartest and probably one of my goofiest friends. And I had the opportunity to do this interview in person while I was in Scottsdale. So that was really cool. Um, so if you'd like to watch that interview, we actually did the interview sitting on yoga balls and barefoot because really that's what it, that's, that's freedom, right? Um, so sometimes um, he's so smart though. And I love all of our conversations that we ever have. I always learn so much from him. I honestly wish I could record all of our conversations because they're so stimulating and I learn so much every time. Um, and this time was really no different. So I think you all will enjoy this episode a lot. And I know there's a lot going on in the world right now, but just because most of us are quarantined does not mean that all of our health issues just disappear. So if we've still had a history of concussions, hormonal imbalances, digestive issues, etc., make sure to still reach out to your local naturopathic doctors or naturopathic doctors that are close to you. Uh, and thankfully, most naturopathic doctors are doing virtual consultations like myself and Dr. Heisig. So make sure you reach out because we all need a little support during quarantine and MDs can give you that support. Okay, well, moving right along to the episode, make sure to leave comments below on what you thought of it and reach out to Dr. Heisig or myself after the show. All right, enjoy. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Hi, Dr. Mark. How are you doing today? Hello. <laughs> I'm doing well. <laughs> Good. I'm so excited to be here in your office right now. This yeah. is fun. We're still piecing it together, but it's it's looking good. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's, I, I really like this. I love the yoga balls. This is really yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's why, that's why I like it. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. Um, and I love that we're both barefoot, too. Yeah, well, I mean socks, but okay, you're it's wearing close socks, enough. But yeah. yeah, whatever. C close enough. <laughs> Anyway, all right, so let's get right into it. So I yeah. ask all of my guests this question because I feel like our stories are really what make us who we are, yeah. and I feel like they're really impactful. So can you tell me a little bit about your story? What's your journey into naturopathic medicine? How did you get here? Yeah, so that started when I was like 11, actually. Uh, so my mom got really, 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 really sick uh -huh. uh, for years and years and years. No one knew what was going on. She had doctors all over the country uh, trying to figure her out. Uh, at one point, she was given four weeks to live, and they sent her to an integrative hospital in uh, Mexico, actually. <laughs> and she went through uh, some therapies there, and all the doctors, like MDs, docs in Mexico, docs in Pittsburgh, like people were all like, oh, you should go to this doctor in Scottsdale because he's close to where you live, and he'll be able to take care of your case. Um, and he was actually a Bastyr grad. So he was an ND, and so I, I had no idea there was a difference between like ND, DC, MD, DO, like whatever. Um, so I grabbed his business card when I was like 14, Googled him, and was like, oh, I'm going to be an ND. Like, I'm going to go to Bastyr. Wow. And so, yeah, so now I'm here. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you really did start really young. Yeah, and my mom's yeah. still alive, obviously. So, uh, yes. <laughs> not obviously, obvious to you, because yes. you know, but, <laughs> but know. yeah, my mom made it. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's yeah. so great. Um, that's really cool. So what kind of drew your interest more into the functional neurology um, Revinbo, you know, like yeah. physical medicine type of world. That was a total accident. So I got to MD yeah. school, or ND school, um, and I wanted to drop out after the first year because I was totally not interested. Um, and because I was, I was an exercise science major in undergrad, I was a personal trainer, I was a hockey player, so I was like super into movement anyway. And I was like, ah, school, like this isn't what I want to do. Um, and then Anna Martin, Dr. Anna Martin, uh, at the time she was uh, head of the physical medicine club and she I have no idea how she found me I have no idea how she knew my name but one day I got a call and she's like oh you should come do this Revimo seminar it's a movement thing I heard you're a phys med guy you should come by and do it um, so I did it I loved it it was like exercise stuff um, and then Edith Dr. Edith was mm -hmm. the person who created Revimo was teaching Revimo and she goes oh if you like this you'd like functional neurology so I just like on a yeah. whim started just, studying neurology. It took me like two years into neurology before it finally clicked. And I was like, oh, this shit is really cool. Wow. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but I was like, this is really, <laughs> this is really cool. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, so it took you two years to actually like really get into it. Yeah. To even understand yeah. what was happening. Like I had no idea. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> neurology is probably like the most complex um, system or debate. I feel like there's things that confuse the hell out of me. And it just, I found my niche. So. That's true. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Um, okay. So then, uh, yeah. So then after getting really into that world, uh, what was, 
what was kind of the trajectory of your your path? Like in neurology? Yeah. Originally, I thought I wanted to do movement disorders because it seemed like a natural progression of like, oh, I'm into movement, I'm into exercise, I'm into, RevMO is all about kind of like optimizing movement. So I was like, oh, movement disorders is kind of the opposite <laughs> of optimal movement. Yeah. I'll get into that. And so that was kind of what I thought I wanted. Um, and then slowly, it, like through school, I saw a lot of dementia. I saw a lot of like neurodegenerative stuff. Um, and then that with the research on like CTE and concussion and stuff like that, it's, it's kind of mixed right now, okay. but it kind of bled into like, oh, what can we do to prevent neurodegeneration? And just kind of by proxy, I ended up in the concussion Excellent. world, which then worked okay. out because I've hit my head more than a few times. Being Playing a hockey, hockey player, yeah. yeah. So, so it just kind of worked out that I was an athlete. I now get to work with athletes, or I get to work with former athletes who have had head injuries, and I can try to prevent those movement disorders or prevent the neurodegeneration, yeah. or get them back into their sport, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that is really cool. <laughs> yeah. So, um, actually, I, I think to revert back a little bit, could you explain a little bit more about what Rev in Mo actually is? Because I feel Ooh. like I, even I struggle with really understanding what it is, so like yeah. I'm sure a lot of our listeners don't really know. So Revmo is a neurofascial movement system. Okay. Like if there's like one sentence, so neurofascial. So the idea is that we have like muscles and bones and joints don't work in isolation. They're like these integrated systems. And so if you think about the fascia, like a Spider-Man suit that wraps your whole body, mm -hmm. dysfunction at the Spider-Man suit in the knee is going to mess up your hip or your shoulder, you know, like different okay. parts yeah. of your body. Right. So it's all connected. Yeah. So we're not yeah. looking at like, oh, there's foot slap and adductory twist, or there's like these minutia going on when we observe gait or we observe posture. We're looking at like almost energetically, like this person doesn't have lift or this person mm -hmm. doesn't have hollow. And so like what's mm -hmm. going on neurofascially mm -hmm. so that we can kind of sequence exercises right. to automate better posture and better movement. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. If that made any I sense. Know. I'm excited to do the <laughs> Rev and Mo. Um, the, I, I'm excited to have you w walk me through yeah. it in a little bit. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I'm excited about that. But all right, let's get into the concussions. Yes. Let's let's get right into the meat of it. Uh, so what, let's, let's just start from the basics. Yeah. What exactly is a concussion? Okay. <laughs> let's so just start with that. A concussion <laughs> is a, it literally is a functional brain injury. Okay. Um, yeah. So we used to think it had to be, you had to get hit in the head and your brain sloshed and it bruised. Mm -hmm. Like that's what we thought. Not what happens. Right. <laughs> so you can get hit in the head, you can get hit in the torso, you could it, blast injuries, like you don't even have to get hit. It's just like the, I don't even know the physics of it, but like the force of an explosion mm -hmm. can, can jostle it. Right. Yeah. So you're, you think of your brain like a really soft butter or like jello. Mm -hmm. So it just, it kind of moves around and your skull is not a forgiving place. <laughs> um, so if you are to get hit, instead of bruising, it kind of sloshes around and it stretches. Uh -huh. And so it doesn't stretch enough to necessarily tear or kill cells, but it stretches enough to cause enough dysfunction that you get headaches and blurred vision and irritability and emotional ability mm -hmm. and brain fog and all the stuff we see with concussion. Got it. Yeah. And so I know you talked about hockey players and, yeah. and you play hockey yourself too and have dealt with yeah. a few <laughs> concussions Just yourself. A couple, yeah. yeah, have that. you've had a few. Um, so what is like the most like prevalent population to be getting concussions or like what who's most likely to get Ooh. a concussion? Uh, so that's a good question. So it, it's kind of hard to say. So largely we focus, concussion is largely focused on athletes okay. just because they're typically the only people throwing themselves into scenarios where you're going to get hit and beat up mm -hmm. and whatever. Within uh, sports, we see it's more often it's kiddos because there's, I forget the stat off the top of my head, I think it's like 60 million kids playing sports each year. Um, really? So yeah, so it's like... It's wow. a massive amount of kids yeah. that are in contact sports. They have big heads, small bodies. They don't have a lot of dexterity, <laughs> um, so they're at greater risk. Uh, we see rugby has kind of the highest amount. MMA is awful. Oh, um, sure. <laughs> MMA has crazy rates. <laughs> sure. um, but I think in order, it, it goes, uh, depending on which research you look at, it's rugby, football, and hockey are kind of close, and then you go down to soccer and, and so on. Okay. Um, women tend to get more concussions than men. We're not sure why. And women tend so. to have more post-concussion syndrome than men. 
And it could be that men don't report symptoms because we're tough guys <laughs> and we actually get right. post-concussion symptoms. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, so I would say the focus has largely been on athletes. Okay. Yeah, yeah definitely. I know I personally have experienced, uh, I, I know of that I know of whenever I was snowboarding. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. One time. Um, but, but it definitely, you know, I played basketball and so mm -hmm. it's definitely all always falling over because I was one of the shorter ones, you nice. know, <laughs> yeah. I was always getting pushed over. Yeah, I was um, always the smallest guy yeah, yeah. every rink I stepped on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it gets, uh, so I definitely feel that, but, but yeah, it's like, and then I had that one um, accident that, I don't know if you Oh, yeah, 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 that was so Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like yeah. real intense whiplash there. So, um, okay, so let's talk about concussion care. Then. Yes. So what does conventional medicine usually do for concussion care? And what does that kind of process look like for once you get a concussion, you go to see a, a medical doctor, a conventional mm -hmm. medical doctor, what do they usually do? Yeah. So let's play the scenario out. So like I'm a football player, I get hit on the field right. and I'm kind of down for a little bit longer or I feel kind of dazed. So it should be an athletic trainer, a coach, a doctor comes out and they ask you about certain symptoms. If you have any symptom on, uh, typically it's a SCAT-5, a sport concussion assessment tool, fifth edition. Um, if you have even one symptom, they're like, it's a concussion, we're gonna pull you out of the game. Okay. Um, so they pull out of the game, you look for red flags. And what would some red flags or symptoms be? So symptoms could literally just be, I don't feel right. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna fog, I have blurred vision, nauseous, headache. Uh, double vision, uh, sort of difficulty remembering, like you don't quite remember okay. the hit. Mm -hmm. the, some of the questions are like, okay, uh, where are we playing right now? Who scored last? Like, who, mm -hmm. when did, you know, like, who did we play last week? Yeah. Just kind of, do you have an awareness of where you're at right now? Or right. did you get hit yeah. pretty hard? <clears throat> Red flags would be seizures, vomiting, um, worsening headache. Um, yeah. So okay. basically, once yeah. once that happens, you get the yeah. diagnosis, and then you should you see a doc. They rule out cervical spine injury. They rule out further red flags. See if there's hemorrhage. Do you need a CT? Um, and after that, for the most part, nothing happens. Okay. They tell you to rest and wait until your symptoms go yeah. away. If they have a baseline test, they'll retest the baseline, and that's right. kind of it. So can you actually? Um, you were just telling me earlier today about this patient that you had. Um, that had recently experienced a concussion and they cleared her and um, now you're working with her. So can you kind of uh, tell that story again? Yeah, so a uh, young girl cheerleader got elbowed in the head on accident, like they were practicing some formation or drill. She got elbowed in the head as that girl was falling and so then she, she got hit in the head and then oh, hit her yeah. head on the floor. Yeah. So that happened early January, um, went to a local health care facility out here, um, they diagnosed her, worked her up, told her to rest, didn't, didn't do anything, told her to rest, re-ran the baseline later, said, okay, you're good to go, go back out. Mm -hmm. She's still getting headaches after practice, she's still, so they missed a lot of steps. Mm -hmm. I asked about certain tests that yeah. are standard of care, or not standard of care, but certain tests that are becoming standard of care that mm -hmm. are, there's a lot of research behind, nothing was done other than just kind of rest and wait until okay. it goes away. Yeah, is, so what are some of the things that could yeah. be done um, and that you would normally do in your practice? Yeah, so normally concussion assessment is gonna be the SCAT-5, possibly yes. impact testing, which is a computer test. Okay. Um, and then you should go through cranial nerves, balance, vestibular testing, okay. right? So a good neuro doc or a good concussion doc is gonna do that. Yeah, so like right? a for a <clears throat> full on neurological exam, yeah. physical yeah. exam. Yeah. So they run through SCAT-5 as kind of symptoms, memory, things like that. Okay. Uh, impact test is another cognitive test. Um, and then the neuro exam, so that's, that's kind of that. Okay. And it used to be not even that good, but that's kind of where it's at. It's mm -hmm. like, let's just see how the brain's doing, let's see mm -hmm. how you compare. Ideally, you have a baseline test so that at the concussion we can see which deficits. Is, is it like memory, verbal, is it visual, spatial? Is it mm -hmm. So we can see where the deficits are and then we can retest you again to see that you're actually good to be cleared. Okay. Um, and the reason it's important to have a baseline is because if you go off normative values, you could literally flip a coin. Uh, and because the normative be, values can be, be yeah, the normative values can be 50% either, either way. Okay. Um, so, because some athletes are really elite 
<laughs> some are good students, some aren't. Some are, so they'll they'll score differently. On okay. Them. So it's kind of like uh, like the MMSE for Alzheimer's testing, you know, like sort of like a baseline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like if you're a little bit more educated, you, you can, kind you of can skate just through. skate through. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So typically, like, there's different ways that we'll grade uh, concussion baselines based off of if they're like an A student or B student or a C student, because okay. we can kind of filter through for some of that. Okay. Um, where that falls short is that there's more and more research coming out that sub-threshold exercise, sub-symptom threshold exercise uh -huh. um, is initiated earlier is better. So we used to say you have a concussion, rest, don't do anything, go in a dark room, don't listen to noise, okay. like don't do anything. And now we're saying like, hey, we, we found that there's research that shows that kids who didn't listen to their doctors and literally just went out and started exercising and playing again, recovered faster than the kids who did listen to their doctors. Yeah. And so the University of Buffalo, I believe, has the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test, which is a very sub, you know, like sub max effort test, but they, they basically, how hard can you go before you experience your symptoms worsening? Mm. And the heart rate, so like say I get to 150 beats per minute before like my headache goes from a two to a six. Okay. And I'm like, oh, my headache's getting worse we'll drop them 80% of that 150 and we'll say, hey, we want you to work out like this every day for a week, come back, we'll retest you. And we see those people that initiate exercise sooner come back quicker. Mm -hmm. They recover faster, they recover better, they don't go into this post-concussion state, which is why I was so frustrated. You got this young athlete going to a concussion center and they don't do any sub-threshold exercise testing or even recommendations, they just said, hey, rest. And it's like, we know the kids that rest and don't return to exercise, the longer it takes for them to return to exercise, the longer it takes for them to return to play. And we have research on that, so it's, it's silly right. to me that they're not doing that. Yeah, and, and that can like really <laughs> hold some people back, especially for yeah. people who are trying to get into the collegiate level or mm -hmm. professional level yeah. um, on, in, in all sports. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's really important. Yeah. Okay, that, that is really, um, that's really cool that that there's there's that baseline. I feel like that's so much of like what we do is mm -hmm. just like being like, okay, how much can you still continue to do yeah. until um, until your symptoms get worse and yeah. keep doing that? Um, that's something like even just something simple like if someone hurts their arm or something, I'm like, well, you can still walk, so yeah. keep moving, right? <laughs> exactly. Like yeah. you know, um, so just like whatever you can move, keep it keep it moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, cool. So what? What do you normally see in your practice that can that that's just provided a lot of benefit for people? Ooh, in terms of concussion? Yeah. In terms of concussion? Yeah. Movement. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I, and I feel like, of course, like we've discussed this before, but every, and my listeners know how much I talk about how everything is so individualized, yeah. right? But um, but movement of mm -hmm. of some sort has yeah. been the most. Movement, um, the biggest thing that I can do to tailor to individualize it is the, the right eye testing. So with functional oh, yeah. neurology, mm -hmm. we're looking a lot at ocular motor function. Right. Um, you can't, I mean, blind people exist, but for largely you can't move very well in the world if you can't see it, mm -hmm. if you don't know where you are in space, right. if your body doesn't know where it is in relation to everything yeah. else. Um, and after concussion, we, we see people have, I want to say it's, some data says 60, some data says 90, but a lot of people have oculomotor dysfunction after concussion, and the visual system, vision and eye movements take up more mm -hmm. than 50% of the pathways in your brain. So we can use, like we can safely assume that, okay, so more than 50% of the brain is devoted to vision and eye movements. That means we can use vision and eye movements to kind of look at different areas of the brain. And if we have functional abnormalities here, we have functional abnormalities there. Okay. And that gives us a clue yeah. into what was damaged in the concussion and how can we approach rehab right. through movement, nutrition, all that kind all of stuff. All that stuff, yeah, without <clears throat> actually, because a lot of these findings aren't really found on the, an MRI or CT scan, correct? Yeah, that's, they're, they're, that's what makes it a concussion, is right. that you won't see it on imaging. There's right. no blood test, there's no imaging right. test. It's just like, oh, hey, it's this invisible condition. Right, yeah. yeah. And so would you say, in terms of, preventing concussions yeah um obviously like we said it's a lot of times with athletes playing mm -hmm. um active sports but um or contact sports in general but what what are what are some practices people can you know incorporate in their daily life to general public yeah um 
we know that it's not so much neck strength as it is neck stiffness mm -hmm. that can help prevent concussions. Um, your ability to react mm -hmm. is really important. So when you look at the biomechanics of a concussion, if you can match the stiffness of, of the impact mm -hmm. and you can do it quick enough, you can stabilize your head so you don't mm -hmm. jostle as much. So if you've got two 300 pound guys coming at each other, but they can match each other's stiffness, mm -hmm. they won't, they'll walk away without a concussion without brain damage. Wow. Um, so it's tricky to say how you're going to get someone's like, right. stiff, but we right. know, so like uh, Dr. Joseph, I think his name is Joseph, Dr. Clark, Doctor, okay. he's over at University of Cincinnati. Um, he's in their neurology department and he implemented vision training for their football program. Um, and so vision training meaning like you've got strobe lenses, so the world's like flashing, flashing, but you got to catch footballs and you got to do really different reactive visual stuff. And we, he, what he found is that I think it was the number of concussions per season. I'm making these numbers up, but the, the drop is, is relatively the same. It'd be like if there was 12 concussions this season, mm -hmm. uh, he implemented vision training. There was two or three the next season. Oh, wow. Number of hits didn't yeah. go down. Number of sacks didn't go down. It was the player's ability to react and prepare for the hit yeah. that decreased the concussion incidence. A new coach came in, didn't like the vision training, took away the vision training. Concussions went back up. They re-implemented it. Concussions went back down. So vision training can be really cool. Yeah, and yeah. that was that was kind of what I was thinking whenever you were saying how the vision training and, and working on the ocular movements yeah. can be beneficial for post-concussion. Yeah. I could see how that can be beneficial to prevent. Yeah, so that's well. yeah, that's one of the things I do with baseline is like part yeah. of my baseline testing isn't just the scat and the impact and you know like seeing where your cognitive function mm -hmm. at, it's seeing where your ocular motor function's at because okay. everyone has, everyone walks around with functional deficits. Right. So it's like, are you weak to the left? Like I tell athletes, like I can tell you which side you're going to get beat to. Yeah. Because we can do that pretty accurately. We can say like, hey, you're, if you're a defenseman, you're likely to get beat to the left or you're likely to get beat to the side because we can see where you're more reactive and where, you're, where your visual spatial deficits are. Yeah. So we can boost those up for performance, but then we also have a baseline for after concussion. We can go, oh, that got worse mm -hmm. along with your you know, like cognitive, verbal memory, whatever. Or whatever yeah. other parts of the brain were affected. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think um, you posted this video of a hockey player hitting n multiple oh, different yeah, targets. Oh, yeah, the All-Star game. Yeah, yeah it yeah. was really cool. And I, I, I remember just being like really obsessively watching it because it was <laughs> super cool how there was just this one spot he could not get to. Yeah. And, um, and it was very clearly associated with um, yeah. that part of his brain yeah. that was yeah, so, affected. Yeah. Yeah, can you explain that a little yeah, bit more? Yeah, so we, we know more about, there was a, so there's two researchers in eye movement, Lee and Z, um, they've got this book that if you can't fall asleep at night, you should try and read because it'll knock you out. <laughs> um, but uh, I forget if it was Lee or if it was Z, but one of those guys co-authored a paper where they were talking about like eye movements in the 21st century, like why aren't clinicians doing bedside eye movement exams, why aren't we doing this? Because we know that saccades, fast eye movements, are wonky in movement mm -hmm. disorders. We know that pursuits are wonky in movement disorders, concussion. We know that gaze mm -hmm. stability, a red eye just got FDA approved for gaze stability for detecting early Parkinson's disease. Um, right. And so we know that we know that so much of the brain is devoted to vision eye movements, and it's silly that we're not using it mm -hmm. for, for clinical assessment. We know more about how the cerebellum controls our eyes than we know about how it controls our fingers or our feet, which is silly that we then don't use that. Yeah, to yeah. use that as a yeah. modality. I totally went off on a tangent because that got me excited and I forget the question. <laughs> it was about the hockey player yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, hitting yeah, yeah. the targets. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the hockey player is hitting the targets. Cerebellum, we know more about how it controls eye movements and this and the other. So he's not able to hit this bottom left pocket. Mm -hmm. And so we know that him looking at it, that bottom left pocket correlates with his right cerebellum or one of the um, posterior canals of the vestibular system. So if we threw him on an air X pad, we could expect a specific way pattern, uh, sway pattern. If we threw him through the right eye, we could expect deficits in saccades, or we could expect deficits in pursuits in specific patterns, and we could mm -hmm. tease that out and then train that. So he should be able to hit that pocket better. Got it. That's so Which cool. Is, yeah. yeah, that is so fascinating. And I actually, I do eye exercises regularly, <laughs> um, and I recommend them sometimes. But it's, it's so funny how... Um, like so many people think I'm kind of crazy whenever mm -hmm. I'm like talking about eye exercises, but it makes sense on how much of our yeah <laughs> of our ocular movements affect our brain and yeah. vice versa. Uh, yeah, yesterday I got a patient uh, post concussion. Uh, resting heart rate is way too high. The sympathetic system is just kind of out of whack. Uh, 
downward eye move. So for anyone who knows neurology, it was a it was a downward pursuit within phase optokinetics. So your what does that mean? So there's <laughs> optokinetic is a is a reflexive response. Okay. So like imagine you're driving in a car and there's a bunch of trees outside and you just kind of zone out. Mm -hmm. Your eyes will pick a tree, follow it, snap, and pick the next tree. And so mm -hmm. your eyes kind of look like tick 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 yes. tick. So if I'm moving in the world, and I'm moving this way, the world is moving that way, right? So I've got to be able to attenuate and depress right. that optokinetic response so that I can stay focused on a target. So if I'm an athlete, I've got to be able to move, see the crowd, see the stands, see the other players, but focus on the puck or focus on my net, you know? Mm -hmm. So being able to attenuate that optokinetic response is really cool. And when we use in-phase optokinetics, it does different things to the vestibular system, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. um, but this downward eye movement, with in-phase optokinetics, dropped your resting heart rate from 95 to 70. And mm -hmm. boop, and we were able to stabilize it for a few minutes, and then it would slowly rise back up. And then we would use the eye movement, drop it back down. Wow. So guess where her homework is? <laughs> you know, it's just right. we took a screen grab of that, and then, that video, and she's going to practice that. And then we're going to come back and see how autonomics are doing, see how balance is doing. It's really simple, but really yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's... <laughs> So it's so simple but so complex at the same time. I yeah. feel like it's, the neurology is complicated. <laughs> yeah, but the then bring it down. Yeah. The application seems almost stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Okay, so um, before we move on to the rapid fire questions, mm -hmm. do you have anything else that you would like to talk about uh, in terms of concussions that we may have missed or we haven't Ooh, gotten to? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the easiest thing for people to do at home is breathe. <laughs> Paced breathing. Breathing is yeah. so powerful. Yeah. Um, so I use the heart yeah. math for biofeedback, yes. but um, yeah, if you can do paced breathing, whether you want to do a one to two inhale, exhale, or a one to one, um, keeping it around six breaths per minute or lower, somewhere between four and six. Uh, six breaths per minute. Yeah. yeah. So if I, I have people go five seconds in, five seconds out. Okay. And I don't say like five seconds, hold it for five. Like, you know, where some people will suck in for two seconds and they hold for three and then they breathe out. Uh -huh. um, try to breathe like, you know, mm -hmm. for the, in for the whole, out right. for the whole. Um, that's awesome. It's awesome. It does great things for the parasympathetic and sympathetic right. balance. It does things for cerebrovascular okay. blood flow. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah. Um, so if it's crucial one, for life. Yeah. You need to be able to breathe. Yeah. And so, so often we forget in our yeah. really stressful Everything's up societies. Here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So if there's one thing you had a concussion or you've been dealing with concussions and symptoms forever, just breathe. Like, yeah, just start breathe, with breathing. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay, and do you have any other resources? So you mentioned the one with Lee and Z. Um, oh yeah, you, that's like a nerdy resource. That's yeah, like, that's like super nerdy. Yeah, that's like a you said, yeah. you said it would put you to bed. Yeah, because uh, it's that nerdy. Yeah. All right. Um, any other resources that you have that you would recommend? General concussion. Uh, a Bastier grad recently mm -hmm. wrote a book on concussion. Concussion rescue. Okay. Um, Dr. I'm going to butcher his name, so if he ends up hearing this, I really apologize. Dr. Kabran Chopek. Um, sure. Concussion Rescue. He works at the Amen Clinics oh, cool. Um, okay, cool. in Seattle. And so that was a really good, very well written um, look at everything from diet to hormones to meditation to exercise, nutrition, right. all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's a very useful resource for people with concussion. Definitely. Yeah. And kind of bringing it full circle to how everything is so yeah, connected. Yeah. So, um, eating McDonald's every day, the concussions, yeah, probably, probably not, not a great to, idea. Yeah. yeah probably, definitely not a good yeah. idea. <laughs> um, so, okay, cool. Um, all right. So let's get into the rapid fire questions. Uh, these are, I call them rapid fire questions just because they're, <laughs> they're like quicker, but, okay. but you don't have to answer them rapidly. You can take your time. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <It's good> pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can take a deep breath. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So what, the first question is, what does Mahan health mean to you? Mahan health. That's the optimal health. Like yes. the perfect health. Great health. I think Mahan health to me is like, it is freedom to engage in your life. Like it, you can do what you want with your body when you want with your body and there's not really a limitation to that mm -hmm. it is just freedom yeah <laughs> so that yeah that's yeah i like that freedom yeah. that's yeah. that's really yeah. what it is it's yeah. it's liberating yeah yeah i love it um okay so my next question is these could be related but they don't have to be it's kind of up to you it depends on your health journey but um what was the most difficult health change for you to make in your personal life and what are you still working on meditation 
and meditation. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so it's the same answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Because uh, exercise has always been easy for me, almost uh, to the point of like destructive for a while, where I would mm -hmm. just exercise too much. Um, but exercise, movement's always been easy. Nutrition came pretty easily, where I was very concerned with what I was eating. Uh, but like mental health and mindset, and just being able to sit. Mm -hmm. And just like, why can't I sit with myself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was insanely difficult. When I first started meditating, I would break out into sweats. Like I literally mm -hmm. was so uncomfortable. I would break out. And, like I would, I would have to change my shirt. Like I would break out into a sweat. Wow. Um, and now I can meditate. Yeah. Um, but I still have to, like it's one of those things, like just mental health slowing down, getting out of this like go, go, go mm -hmm. um, is still the biggest challenge for me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I know sitting in stillness is probably one of the hardest things to ever do. Yeah. Um, I feel that myself <laughs> personally too. And I, I feel like a lot of people can relate. As we're sitting and <laughs> bouncing. We, yeah, we're like bouncing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we're bouncing around. Around, so we can't even sit in stillness right now yeah. but um, but yeah I think I, I think it's really good for people to hear that because I do like meditation has really impacted my life in so many positive ways yeah. and I've been promoting it and talking about it so much but everyone just feels really overwhelmed by it yeah. and so knowing that it is it's, hard it's though. hard like it, it is, is hard. hard so yeah. when people are like oh I can't do it it's like like it, I think about it like a workout like you wouldn't walk away from a workout because you got sore or because it was hard to lift the weight. You're like, oh, that's the point. And like, that is the point of meditation is like building that practice of yeah. awareness that might, you know, like, it's building the muscle of our yeah. brain. Right? So it's like, like it's, yeah, why, yeah. Yeah. And it's then hard it's though, hard. Yeah. It, is, it is definitely hard. It's, <laughs> but that's the point. Yeah, yeah. That is the point. And that's why we need to practice it. And that's why it's called a practice. Exactly. And it's not called perfection or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just a practice. <laughs> okay. And then the very last question I have for you is if you could have a PSA commercial about anything that was health related, um, that, that you could promote to the whole world, what would it be about and why? I told you before it was going to be puppies. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> puppies are adorable and they're good for your health. Um, puppies are great for your health. Actually though, I would, I would probably not even target nutrition or movement or anything. I would, I have no idea what it looks like, Okay. but something that tries to spark like almost like a, like why, like a sort of like a, a mindset shift, like a commercial that forces people to like, okay, like why am I going for the third coffee? Why mm -hmm. am I going for the chips? Why am I choosing the things that I'm doing. Like yeah. something that kind of encourages people to live on purpose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like my healthy on purpose yeah. promotion. Yeah, right. like something that's just like, dude, if you're gonna eat cake, great, like cool, enjoy it, eat the whole cake, eat three cakes, I don't care, as long as you're doing it on purpose. Right. Like you know that you're living on purpose. Like I see so many people come in and they're just like shocked at what they can do with nutrition and exercise and sleep and it's like, it's not that they didn't know it, it's just that we were the first person or the first people as naturopathic doctors that kind of explained it and enforced it and then they felt it and mm -hmm. said like, yeah, dude, if you just did the simple things right. and you lived like it mattered, <laughs> like, yeah, the health kind of takes care of itself. Right, right. And I think, I think that's really cool because we actually talked about in one of my other episodes, I interviewed Dr. Aaron Moore and we talked okay. about subconscious reprogramming yeah. and that was like a big part of it. And I think that's such an important part of health. Um, I think Dr. Perlmutter just wrote a book on this okay, as really? well. Yeah. yeah. I want to say it's Perlmutter. I'm bad at remembering everyone's names. I've had several concussions. <laughs> but yeah. Working on yeah, it yeah, still. Yeah. yeah. See, and that's the thing. Like, it's always a work in progress. Exactly. We're always, we're all constantly on our health exactly. journeys. Yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. Okay. So, so that's all I got for you today. Uh, yeah. What are, how are, how can people find you? Where are you? Uh, I am at drheisig.com. H-E-I-S-I-G. Um, I'm on Instagram at the same thing, Facebook. Just search my name. I tried to make it easy. Yeah. <laughs> but Facebook, simple. Instagram. I'm, I'm dipping into the TikTok game horribly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, my website, drisic.com, Instagram, Facebook. I have a LinkedIn I don't use too often. Twitter I don't use too yeah. often. TikTok I don't use too often. But... And you're based in Scottsdale, yeah. Arizona. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much for yeah. doing this. Thank you yeah. for having me. This is great. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. 
I hope you all enjoyed that episode and now have a better understanding of how the impacts of head injuries or concussions usually continue far after one is cleared from their doctor and how there are some things that you can start to do to reverse those symptoms and feel better finally. So I will have Dr. Heisig's information in the show notes below, so make sure to check him out. Uh, but that is all I got for you today. Be sure to stay tuned for what calls call to actions we put out there to support our healthcare providers and the emergency licensure of naturopathic medicine. I'm wishing you all Mahan or great health, and I will see you next time.